Hello, everyone. We're just going to give another minute or a minute and a half just for everybody to get in and get settled before we start today's CLE. Welcome to AI Unveiled Legal Implications and Ethical Considerations. Say that five times fast. Uh, so just settle in, get some lunch, get some coffee, get some tea. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of stuff very fast. I want to get you as much information as possible uh, with regard to AI. So this will be a really fun one, but also a really fast one. And hopefully, not a boring one because ethics CLEs aren't really known for their spiciness. Uh, so hopefully I'll make it uh, pretty fun for everybody. And my hope is that you lead this CLE learning something that you didn't know before, or at least thinking about something that you didn't know before, especially as it concerns ethical considerations with AI, which I know is a super hot button topic, honestly, for right now. All right. So we're gonna get started in a minute. Let me just make sure we are good to go. We are recording, let's do it. All right, so welcome everyone to today's CLE, AI Unveiled, Legal Implications and Ethical Considerations for the Florida Bar. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So I will be answering your questions live, live, live at the end of today's CLE. Uh, if you would like me to answer your questions, just put those into the Q&A box on Zoom. It's right next to the chat one. Uh, so just put them in there or you can put them into the chat box. At this point, I can. there's not that many people I can look and see uh, the questions in the chat box too. And then also the recording and slides are going to be available to you after today's CLE uh, typically gets uploaded on Legal Fuel and things like that. So just look for it there. Oh, and then also, too, we'll give you the course number and everything and all that jazz at towards the end of today's CLE. All right, a little bit about me. My name is Jordan Turk. I am a practicing family law attorney down in Texas, so you know all the drama all the time. Uh, and now that summer is coming up, it's a busy season in family law land. Real great. <laughs> but I'm also the legal technology advisor at Smokeball. And Smokeball is also hosting today's CLE. So thank you so much to Smokeball uh, for putting it on. But for those who are not familiar with what we are, what we do, we are an all-in-one cloud-based practice management system for attorneys. So this means that we help you manage all of your day-to-day -day legal and administrative tasks like case management, billing, trust accounting, everyone's favorite, because uh, who doesn't like three-way trust account reconciliation, which sounds weird when I say it, uh, and so much more. And we do it all in one place. So if you want to learn more about Smokeball and how we can help your particular firm, which I highly encourage you to do, we're going to have a poll at the very end of today's session where you can request that we reach out to you with more information. And also, we happen to be a member benefit provider for the Florida Bar, which means that you get a 10% discount on all of our Smokeball subscriptions. So this is a huge, huge deal. If you want to learn more about it, you can scan that QR code or Austin is going to drop the link into the chat so you can click on that and explore more about Smokeball and the Florida Bar and what we can do together. All right, so getting into AI. So we actually did our own survey, uh, our Smokeball State of Law report about AI and particularly with regard to attorneys. And so we asked this question on a scale of one to 10, how much do you believe AI is transforming or will transform the legal profession? And vast majority of people you can see five and up said that it would be some sort of a transformation. Very few said it would have no impact whatsoever, which is what we're seeing right now. There's just going to be a huge transformation in the next three to five years. And then we asked, what areas do you think are most likely to be affected by AI in the next five years? And no brainer, legal research being number one, and especially with what's happening now with case text and co-counsel, which I will be talking about. It makes perfect sense. Document creation, which all, again makes sense, especially with Smokeball and what we do with document automation. It just makes sense to start incorporating AI into that too. And then do you perceive AI to be a threat to your job? So this one was interesting because the vast majority said no. And I'll get into some studies that are being done right now by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and things like that on AI. And actually, uh, according to them, we should be a lot more concerned, I guess, than we are, or at least the people who were taking the survey. But I'm not all that concerned, spoiler alert. Uh, do you have ethical considerations for the use of AI in the legal industry? Obviously, vast majority said yes, or maybe on this one. So this is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger, and then state bars are going to basically be trying to adapt, adapt, adapt as we go forward with AI, specifically generative AI in the future. So what we're going to be talking about today, it sounds like a lot, I'm going to go fast, it's going to be fun. Uh, so we'll talk about key challenges, uh, you know, we'll talk about Florida's AI ethics opinion, social and ethical considerations, especially when it comes to facial recognition software, things like that, economic impacts, intellectual property, which is 
becoming a really fun thing, you know, when it comes to AI in the uh, legal field, privacy and confidentiality, liability. We'll talk about the main problems of AI, the precedents that we're setting right now, and then something that Joshua Walker, who is a former founder of Codex, he's an attorney, he's in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's something that he likes to call the bias sphere, and so we'll go into that too with regard to AI. All right, I want to start this off by noting the differences between extractive AI and generative AI. So generative AI is the new kid on the block, the hot button topic. That's what you're going to hear a lot about in the coming years. So generative AI is some, and we'll talk about it, but that's going to be your chat GPTs of the world. Extractive AI, which I like to call kind of the OG AI for legal is something that finds relevant results within existing data. So think about Westlaw, right? Where you're typing in, you're trying to find a statute, you're trying to find a case, all of, and then they're pulling that case for you. They're not creating anything new with it, right? They're not drafting anything. They're just saying, hey, here's your answers, here are your cases, here are your keywords, you know, that you used. And that's what extractive AI is. So actually attorneys, we've been using extractive AI for decades. You know, with regard to that, we've been using AI. However, generative AI is something completely different. So generative AI is actually creating new content from existing data. So if you're asking it to draft a brief or you're asking it to draft a client email, it is putting together brand new data. It's putting together a brand new draft based off of data that it's scraped from the internet and everywhere that it can find. But those are the key differences. So you'll hear that a lot, like, hey, generative AI and how is that different? than what we normally have or what we've had in the past. It's really about creating brand new content from existing data. And it's more, it, generative AI cut its teeth on predictive texts. So for instance, if you were to type in somewhere, Mary went to the grocery store to get a carton of blank, right? Usually that would mean eggs. And so generative AI has scraped the internet enough to know that that next word in that sentence is usually going to be eggs. And so that's what I mean by predictive text. It does that based off of all of the large language models that it's studied in order to come up with that word eggs. And then it, and that's kind of how it snowballed and has been able to create brand new content. All right, so key challenges uh, when it comes to AI. So we're going to go through some of these challenges with the use of technology overall. Uh, so one of the issues with AI is social and ethical considerations. We're gonna talk about Florida rules too. And we're going to talk about economic impacts, IP, confidentiality and liability, and all that jazz. So let's get into it. So first of all, I know y'all are probably pretty familiar with this, but the Florida Bar actually issued its own uh, ethics opinion on this in January of this year. And Florida has actually been at the forefront of this. Uh, very few states have been able to keep up with generative AI and keep up with, you know, ethical guidelines or trying to promulgate some sort of new regulations with regard to them. Florida is one of the few. So far, it's really just Florida, California, and New York. And Florida, I believe, was the first. Uh, so they've been really on the ball about this. You have a very active bar that really wants to try to help its attorneys, which is really cool to see. Uh, and so, but all that to say, Florida's opinion, I'm sure a lot of bars are going to start echoing this, a lot of other state and local bars. As a reminder, this is not yet binding. I think they've asked uh, the board to adopt this, but it, nothing's been uh, fully binding yet. But also none of this is really uh, life-changing <laughs> with regard to what Florida is saying, hey, let's adopt XYZ for generative AI. It's really just taking the existing opinions that you have. So let's say confidentiality, privacy, things like that, and saying, hey, these also need to apply to AI. So for instance, with confidentiality, right? It's recommended, Florida is now saying, hey, it's recommended that you get the client's informed consent if you're going to use a third-party generative AI program, things like that. You must understand the technology that you're using. Again, this is not a new thing. You've always had a duty of technology competence, but now you have this additional generative AI portion to that oversight of non-interning employees. Same type of deal. It's your bar card on the line. If you are using AI to draft anything in your office or to do anything in your office, the buck ultimately stops with you, which means that you are responsible for the output of this AI. So if you go to ChatGPT and ask it for case law and it gives you fictitious case law that you then submit to the court, it is not ChatGPT's fault that it gave you fake case law. It's ultimately your problem because you submitted it to the court without double checking it. So that's really what it's saying. And overarchingly, that's what all of these states are saying is 
hey, if you are using generative AI, treat it like it's an employee in your firm. I like to say, treat it like a summer associate, like a 1L summer associate who has no idea what they're doing, but they're eager, they wanna help you and they're very smart. So obviously you're going to let them draft things, they're going to ultimately give it to you, but it's up to you to double check that, to double check the citation, to double check that the holdings are correct in these cases. So ultimately remember that you are responsible for the output of anything that comes out of your office, which includes generative AI. So I encourage everyone to read these rules. If you want a copy of them, let me know. I can send them to you. Quick Google search will also uh, have these pop up for you. But really, truly start reading through them and start understanding and wrapping your mind around AI and how it's going to work in the legal practice. There's also a big thing about billing well, with regard to AI. So even though, and this is what Florida says too, even though generative AI might make you more efficient, this increase in efficiency shouldn't result in falsely inflated claims of time for you. So if AI allows you to complete a petition in half an hour when it normally takes you an hour, you can't go and charge your client for that hour because that doesn't make sense. Right? It, it seems a little uh, shady. So what I'm seeing attorneys do instead of that so that they can make a profit off of utilizing AI, because it already is giving them more free time back in their day, wouldn't it be nice if it could also make them money? Uh, a lot of attorneys are switching to kind of a hybrid fee schedule. So normally I do hourly rates, right? I bill out at 300 an hour, but what I could do instead is for petitions, say, which normally take 45 minutes to an hour to draft, depending if it's a very vanilla petition, even less, but it doesn't take that long at all. It's very easy to automate or use AI with regard to the drafting of that petition. And so instead of saying you're going to use your hourly rate on that petition, you're instead going to say this is going to be a fixed fee. And for petitions to be drafted and filed and served, we charge $500 or something like that. And so for that chunk of time just for the petition, and you put this into your fee agreement, that's going to be a fixed flat fee of X amount of money. So that means even if you get it done in 10 minutes, you're still profiting off of that, but you're not being, but you're not falsely inflating your time uh, with regard to it, if that makes sense. If you want to learn more about that, let me know. I give a whole, I give CLEs on uh, alternative fee arrangements all the time, but I think that's kind of what's going to start happening as AI, as AI gets uh, more widely adopted by lawyers. All right, social and ethical considerations. So with social and ethical considerations, there are several kind of examples that demonstrate what the issue is here. Uh, so for example, the use of facial recognition software for identification purposes, the technology exists, uh, I would say this, so the technology as it exists isn't accurate, when it comes to facial recognition, isn't super accurate at identifying women or identifying people of color. So it creates this issue with misidentification and potentially is denying people access to areas that they should have access to, or you know sensitive items that they should be able to unlock with facial ID and things like that. So for example, it's already being used in housing, which you can imagine there are lawsuits already, I think in the works for this but it's being used in access to events to deny somebody if they've been banned from a specific venue, things like that. And so businesses that are designed to use this technology have put a, they have put a little bit of forethought into how they're adopting this technology, but not enough, uh, but not enough at the end of the day, as far as like how they're using it and is it, and is it ethical? Uh, but really, so for us, it's thinking about what other steps can you take to account for the misidentification that's in there? And what kind of steps for verification do you need to adopt? So one of the examples for that is there are businesses who have to be proactive about thinking, how do we address the inequalities that live in this technology? And how do we put in backup procedures to address these issues of people who are being misidentified so that they're treated fairly? So that's one of those issues that arise when it comes to ethical considerations and social considerations, especially. Another issue that is rampant uh, in all of AI, not just facial ID, is the implicit biases that are inherent in the technology. And we'll talk about uh, more of that towards the end of today's session. But it's not, think about it this way, it's not only the developer bias that's going on here, but there's also data bias, there's also user bias, there's just a ton of ton of biases that are present uh, when it comes to creating and using AI. And well, I guess I can, let me use specific examples uh, for that for you to understand. So there's already some AI technology 
AI technology that exists uh, surrounding sentencing guidelines, for example. So this is where judges will make decisions based upon this generative AI technology. Well, the issue is, as we are all aware, is that the criminal justice system has obvious biases you know, built in. And we all know this. There's also a huge access to justice issue. We're all aware of this. But these biases get perpetuated by the use of this technology, particularly when individuals often don't necessarily understand or they're not as tech savvy. They don't even know that these biases are built in. So there might be a situation where the bias is getting exaggerated because people see it and they think, hey, this is an objective AI piece of software that's making decisions, when in reality, it actually possesses a lot of bias. So that's something that we have to be cognizant of. And there's been a push for more transparency of this. And I think we'll see more of that uh, as time goes on. Also, we need accountability with the development and use of the algorithms to try to address some of these issues and to really recognize how bias is built in and how we can kind of actually get around that. So, and maybe that means, you know, we need to figure out what kind of data we're using or maybe able to use to, in order to train our language models better. So, and I'll say that a lot, large language model, but the data sets that we use to train AI, maybe we can figure out ways to better train them and avoid some of the biases that are in the existing data that it's using. Another kind of consideration is on the social and ethical level, and it comes into play here, and it's around misinformation, which is happening a lot. So bots have been used to spread a lot of misinformation, and this is being used to manipulate people. We all know this. This is happening every day. This is on the news a lot, and it's happening now at exponential rates. And so you know how governments and social media platforms have to think about things like how do we address this? Is this something that we even need to address? Because it's being used to manipulate people? I would say yes. Uh, but it's just another challenge that we face with AI and particularly having provisions like Section 230 in place, which allows platforms, you know, to kind of uh, get around liability for allowing the spread of misinformation. All of this is stuff to consider. Uh, we also have an issue that comes up with reliance on chatbots which we're going to hear a lot more of in the news with generative AI. I think you're seeing that a lot with people playing around with chatbots on uh, especially car dealership pages where they're saying, you know, well, I'll offer you X, Y, Z if you'll give me this Ford F-150 truck, you know, and this 2024 Ford F-150 truck. And they basically trick the chatbot into saying, OK, it's a deal. And so there's a question of, is that actually a deal? And so all and so there are quite a few cases now uh, being litigated with regard to chatbots, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, this got caught in my throat, uh, but you know, the problem with chatbots is they're not very sophisticated. They hallucinate in a lot of key areas like financial, medical, and legal advice. So basically the three areas that you want uh, the most veracity from, uh, they do not give it. And so that can really harm these individuals who are relying on this technology for, you know, truth. <laughs> so like there is the layman who's relying on it for legal advice, maybe on a firm's uh, website, and they're not realizing that that chatbot can be inaccurate. And they need to really rely on an attorney instead to help them out through a complex situation, but they're not really understanding that, right? And so we also have, you know, key decision makers like judges who are using AI not only in sentencing guidelines, but some judges have started to use it in coming to decisions. And the scary thing about that is judges are not required to disclose that at this time. So it could make it harder, for example, if you, in the criminal context, criminal context especially, if you are a defendant uh, where you're trying to challenge a judge's decision and you didn't even know that this AI technology had been used in even coming to your sentence, uh, that's a problem, right? Because that's a bias that's already against you that you didn't even know existed or that the judge was using. So I think we'll have to see some more guidelines around that and about disclosures especially uh, coming from judges, I would imagine. And the other kind of interesting ethical issue here is that users are unable to differentiate the technology as a tool, and they sometimes what you call personify it, right? So for example, there was someone, <clears throat> sorry, someone in Europe uh, last year who got into a conversation with one of these chatbots and ended up negotiating with it. And the agreement was that the chatbot would save the world from climate change if the man committed suicide. And he ended up committing suicide because he was not able to differentiate that the chatbot was not real. Obviously, there were some other issues at play there for that man. But still, it's hard for some people to understand that, that this is not a real person or some kind of entity that can actually affect the world or make change. So I think some type of better education and uh 
you know, for people to truly understand that these are tools and not real thinking things will be necessary in the future. So economic impacts. AI is really growing, and I know I keep saying this, but AI is really growing at an exponential rate, especially over the next uh, couple decades. Some economists have said that there might be up to 50% mass unemployment by 2024 and 2025. Uh, and then actually the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, warned that nearly 40% of jobs across the globe could be affected by the rise of AI with high income economies high, uh, facing the greatest risk. So this is, I think, scary for a lot of people. And tech has been having quite a few layoffs, you know, in the past year and a half. And so I think a lot of people kind of have their hackles up uh, with this. But as a society, then, you would think we need to start looking at how we address this transition period. So if we have this exponential job growth and AI and job loss from AI is going to outpace jobs created by AI, which is a problem, our governments aren't necessarily prepared to deal with that. So what do we need? So maybe given the amount of people that you know will lose their jobs, maybe we're going to have a lot more reskilling of people. Like for instance, when mines close and there's an influx of money to retrain people on something else, reskilling is probably going to happen for a lot of people. But really, truly governments probably need to start thinking about things like universal healthcare, universal basic income, or some sort of supplement to make the transition easier on society as a whole. Right, intellectual property, the good stuff. So, uh, we have a lot, we have a whole host of, you know, new issues with regard to AI and AI created inventions like music and code and photos. And the issue here is a couple things. So one, a lot of these chatbots such as ChatGPT have been trained on data sets that belong to others. So how GPT works, that type of technology is imagine the whole wide world of the internet and this software is just scraping all of these words, all of this music, all of this code, anything that it could possibly get its hands on. And it's using that to then create new documents, or it's using that to kind of regurgitate uh, to you when you ask it a question, things like that. So that's really how this is working. So as the internet grows, so too does the data set, do the data sets that GPT is trained off of, essentially. So it's boundless at this point. But this also creates certain infringement issues uh, as well, <clears throat> infringement issues for the output, right? Because, hey, you're kind of copying text from others, so it makes sense that there's some infringement issues on the output of GPT, of chat GPT, but it also creates issues uh, of infringement by the, uh, by the companies themselves. And we're already starting to see some lawsuits around this, so Getty filed suit against stable diffusion. And so we'll, and then there's also one, uh, there's a class action against Google right now for data scraping. And I'll go into that on the next slide, I think. But so there's going to be quite a few of these lawsuits uh, coming up, especially as it comes to intellectual property and data that's already, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and content that's already been uniquely created or copyright. And so we'll end up seeing how the courts decide on this. It's going to be a very interesting next couple of years as far as AI and IP go. But additionally, there's a lot of issues about users, like what can you as a user assert in terms of ownership of something that has been generated from AI, but you did it from your prompting. So I asked AI a question and it gave me an output. Can I go and then copyright that output? So a district court has already said that if there's no human creation element, uh, that's not something that can be, for example, copyrighted. So no human element, no copyright, essentially, when it comes to AI. But that's not the really interesting question, you know, is it? The interesting question is what amount of human involvement is enough to get something copyrighted? So is some amount of human creation, you know, and maybe slightly changing the output of AI, is that sufficient? Uh, you know, what if we what makes something protectable essentially. And we don't necessarily know where that line is yet. You'll see more and more courts come out to establish that right, of course. But for now, what we know is if there's no human involvement, there's no protection. There's also another, I believe, there's also another copyright office holding uh, that says something like if it's just prompt engineering, and for those who aren't familiar with what prompt engineering is, that's just the questions that you ask a GPT program. So, hey, you know, do hey, give me a whole, uh, give me a whole, give me five pages 
on the invasion of America by the, you know, it's just like you can, or the invasion, you know, anything that you want, you can do that. And then what it spits out is that content. And so prompt engineering is just the questions that you're asking for GPT. Prompt engineering, actually very, very interesting and very, very tricky because it's very easy to get a lot of information from a question that you ask of GPT. But if you can narrow it down and if you can get very good at prompt engineering, the world is at your fingertips, essentially. So I'm about to do some CLEs on prompt engineering. Highly, highly recommend that you Google that, look it up and start really refining how you ask questions to your generative AI. But the Copyright Office basically said, hey, if there is just some prompt engineering and some additional Photoshop on top of a photo, that's still not protected. So minimal human involvement seems to be not protected, but we don't know where that line is yet, right? And so that'll just be another interesting issue. Okay, and this is what I was alluding to before. So there are going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of lawsuits with regard to data scraping. And again, that's just how these large language models are getting their content that they can then use to spit out things with regard to their generative AI. So uh, eight plaintiffs actually filed suit against Google saying that Google misused their social media content. So they misused their photos from dating websites, their playlists, their TikTok videos, everything that is theirs or at least that they thought was theirs on their social media, Google was using that to train its own uh, its own chatbot called Bard. That's Google's version of its chatbot and other uh, generative AI systems that it's owned. So a lot of people are now suing Google and saying, hey, you can't do this. We never agreed to this. We never gave our consent. And this also includes an author, an investigative journalist who said, hey, Google actually copied my entire book in full to train its generative AI systems. So this will be really interesting to see where this all goes. All right, for a lot of people, especially if you are in IP, uh, this picture looks very familiar. Uh, it's the monkey selfie uh, from, from a few years ago. But when I talk to IP lawyers about generative AI, they tell me that many current AI cases are similar to this monkey selfie case that happened in 2018. Uh, so essentially, just the uh, flip notes of it is that photographer David Slater was on assignment in Ind Indonesia when Naruto, a crested macaque, uh, snapped several photos of himself with Slater's camera. So the monkey just took a selfie of itself, which is here on the right, and it is super cute and very funny. And then the photographer included those photos in a book he published. So PETA came out, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, they came out and they sued the photographer and his publishing company, and they said, hey, you didn't get Naruto's consent, publishing and selling those photos infringed on the monkey's rights under the Copyright Act. And the Ninth Circuit went and affirmed that Naruto lacked standing to claim copyright infringement since he is an animal. So generally, what people have taken this to mean is for animals and now for AI, no human involvement equals no copyright protection. And granted, this was a standing issue case and not a substance issue case. However, most IP lawyers that you talk to will say that they're pretty analogous still uh, to use. And you can still take lessons from this case and apply it to the AI cases that are before the court right now. So really, when you talk to an IP attorney about this and about uh, copyright and about copywriting, uh, things like that, they'll say, hey, the human involvement needs to be sufficiently original and creative, so just obviously prompt writing is not enough, but if you maybe take a rough draft and make it suffi and make sufficiently original revisions to it, that's probably going to be protected, which is interesting. And the other main concern when I talk to my friends about this is the potential for infringement if the output is substantially similar to a pre-existing copyrighted protected work, right? And so that's just as much of a risk, if not more for some businesses as the question of whether the output can be owned by anyone, right? Because if you're copying somebody's book in full and then you're using that verbatim to answer a question, but it's changed maybe a little bit and then you're trying to copyright that, that's going to be insane. And, and I will say too, if you don't know about prompt engineering and why this is kind of dangerous with regard to published works that are already copywritten, for instance, in ChatGPT, you can go and you can ask it to write something in the style of blank. So if it's in the style of a favorite author, you can ask it to do that, which means that you're kind of already in risky territory when it comes to copywriting. All right, privacy and confidentiality. So 
these are the two other items from this section, but it comes up a lot uh, in the use of technology. And typically, you know, not so many people using generative, now with so many people utilizing uh, generative AI chatbots, data input into these platforms and the resulting output from it becomes part of this collective data that's being used to train and create further outputs, which means that what you put into these pieces of technology, especially the ones that are publicly available like ChatGPT, that means that none of that data is confidential. Full stop, none of that data is confidential. What you put into those programs is not confidential. So you as a typical user of this technology need to understand that you're giving what, what you are giving to them and what you are giving to these companies by typing in these questions is basically theirs now. They have it, they're gonna use it. And so inserting private or confidential data as an input to these programs and is a sharing of confidential information and obviously a data breach and obviously also a breach of confidentiality and privacy uh, when it comes to the legal practice and what we do every day. And a lot of businesses are actually getting into trouble about this. Uh, for example, Samsung, oh God, they had a bad couple of years uh, when it came to this. So Samsung had, I think, three severe data breaches last month, in, or they had three severe data breaches in one month last year uh, because employees went into chat GPT and they put in proprietary information including source code and sensitive meeting notes and things like that they put that into GPT to try to uh, make their job easier essentially but it was a severe breach and it hurts the and it at the end of the day it hurts Samsung's competitiveness uh, you know with their competitors too so it was a huge issue for Samsung and we as attorneys have to be particularly careful on the issue and make sure we're not you know unintentionally breaching any any type of attorney client privilege I'm a paranoid person and so this has always uh, been my fear with AI especially with generative AI so with so some companies are trying to take different approaches on this they're putting AI policies in place and they're kind of understanding the importance of having to train employees as to how they're allowed to use this technology, whether you are even allowed to use it. If you have associate attorneys in your office, or especially if you have law clerks coming into your office, you need to make it very clear to them that they are just not to use any type of generative AI software. Or if you have one, make sure that it's legal specific, there are guardrails in place, right? There are safety nets in that case, but a lot of very green attorneys or especially law students don't know anything about client confidentiality, nor do they really care. And so it's incumbent upon the firms to say, hey, this is important. This can absolutely screw us over. You are not to put any of this information into a program like ChatGPT. So just make it very clear to your firm because it's very easy to use and you think that it's completely fine and that it's safe because, oh, OpenAI is this huge company now, but it's not safe. And absolutely, they do not care about your confidentiality whatsoever. Just be very careful. Also, I think it's important to uh, some of the biggest businesses like Samsung. So what happened at Samsung, and obviously that was a huge blow up and it was terrible. Uh, Samsung then decided to create its own internal GPT chatbots to protect some of their uh, proprietary data. So that means that it's all stored in-house, you know, at Samsung. There's no outside or third-party access to that. So you'll see a lot of companies like Smokewall. Uh, we've done the same thing with our generative AI software where it's all uh, into the program and it does not speak to a third-party outside program. So your data is safe and you keep compliant with your confidentiality rules. And this is just already kind of mentioned before when we talked about Florida rules, but just again, be careful. And I want to reiterate this, that when you send information or when you're using applications like chat GPT, you are sharing that information with third party companies. Now, this is different from companies who adopt GPT into their programs and use it in their own way. So ChatGPT is like the public facing, here you go, you can go into it right now, make an account and start using it and start asking it questions. OpenAI, the actual product called GPT, you can actually take that and use it for your own devices, which is really nice for the GPT product. And so that's why a lot of these companies that are coming out with AI software now, they're all basically licensing that software from OpenAI, they're using that GPT, but they're doing it with guardrails in place. So it's not 
being sent to a third party, GPT isn't, or OpenAI isn't using that data that you input into it to scrape and then train its new language models on, that is totally yours and proprietary and stays in its lane for your firm. So that's why it's a little bit different. Uh, but you'll hear GPT used all the time, and a lot of people have that because OpenAI uh, is partnering or people are paying OpenAI to be able to use this type of technology. But again, though, if you're just using regular chat GPT online, uh, that's a third party company. These companies are not keeping your data confidential. They're actually saving all of your queries for at least, I think OpenAI used to save them for at least 30 days. And then they were using that data to train their models, you know, for the future. I don't think they're doing that anymore uh, for the paid version, which I think is like 20 bucks a month, but they still are for the free version. So always, always, always. Uh, keep confidentiality in mind. Huge, huge deal. And read the rules that have been uh, that have been uh, put out by the Florida Bar, or the proposed rules for that proposed amendments. All right, and then privacy and confidentiality. These are some just additional considerations. Uh, for example, with regard to privacy, there is think about voice and face recognition, especially. Uh, legal procedure can kind of be circumvented in a way uh, with these technologies. So, you know, for instance, if Border Patrol wants to search your phone, they can't force you to put your fingerprint down, but maybe your voice or your face will unlock your phone. And if it has that setting, depending on how it's set up, that might allow for an easier way to unlock your devices, which is not good. Uh, we also have a lot of AI technology being used in prediction and profiling, particularly for sensitive areas such as credit, employment, insurance coverage, which is a big thing right now. Uh, and there's some lawsuits starting from that one. And we are already starting to see some states address this on their own because we don't have a federal data privacy framework yet. So some states are looking at either prohibiting the use of AI technology for profiling purposes uh, because it can be problematic. Others are still kind of investigating. It just depends. Uh, but for example, this is becoming a huge issue in insurance because so some of the health insurance companies already being sued right now because they're using AI algorithms to just deny claims. So meaning a human person isn't looking at these claims, it's just an AI algorithm and it's an automatic denial. So they are now being sued. Oh, I'm running behind. Okay, we're gonna speed through some of this. Uh, also, caveat and all, and you know, buyer beware, caveat emptor, uh, as, far as, as far as utilizing generative AI. So on the left, Michael Cohen, we all are aware that he sent a fake AI cases to his attorney. So that's also fun because again, these people are just going into chat GPT and asking for case citations. And here's the deal. <laughs> when you ask chat GPT for cases, it will give you cases and they will look very real. The citations will look very real. They will tell you the facts of those cases and they will look extremely real. They are not. And so that also happened in New York very famously last year, where a New York attorney went, submitted a brief before the court. The court discovered that these cases were fictional and then essentially gave the attorneys a break and said, hey, please go double check your case citations. And the attorney went back into ChatGPT and said, hey, for sure, for sure, does is this case real? And, J and ChatGPT said, of course it's real. Yes, here's the citation again. Here are the facts of the case. And so the attorney went back into court and said, I double checked your honor, this is a real case. And in fact, it was not a real case. And so that's another thing to remember as you go through generative AI, especially ChatGPT. You know, you need to verify everything, but they also do what they call is hallucinations. And so that means that ChatGPT and, and generative AI software just wants to please you just wants to make you happy, wants to give you the answer that you want. But that also means that it will lie to you in order to get that answer for you. So just never believe what they say ever, unless you're using a specific program that is catered to uh, that is catered to law. So for instance, case text, which Thompson Reuters acquired for 650 million, must be nice. <laughs> but, but so what case text does is essentially it will uh, re do the research for you. It will actually also start writing briefs for you. But there are guardrails in place so the cases that it cites are real cases. And it provides you with those citations and the cases for you to actually double check. So that's why utilizing legal specific software is, some, is just a lot better. All right, and then liability. We have some liability issues. 
And especially with responsive, especially when we talk about responsibility or cost. And it's a little bit more complex with AI, right? For example, like just say for example, a self-driving vehicle. So you now have this self-driving executing machine code and a self-executing machine or code that can't really be held liable, right? Because it's not a person. And our legal system, some legal entity has to be held liable. So now we have this ambiguity in the line of causation or fault. You know, who is at fault? Was it the manufacturer? <clears throat> if there was a different company that was the creator of the software, was the creator at fault? Was it the software developer who was ne negligent in inputting the code and who trained the algorithm? Was he or she at fault? Was it the owner of the vehicle, you know, that was ultimately responsible, which is generally the case now. But I think these issues, issues are going to arise, uh, sorry, <laughs> are going to arise as these uh, complex cases kind of grow. And we're going to have all these parties called into court to establish the different levels of liability, you know, as businesses operating in the state, you know, in this kind of space. I think it's very important for companies to add some sort of forethought into their agreements with their customers and their vendors. This includes obviously lawyers with their clients, uh, but to put something into their agreements to address some of this ambiguity, right? And so that they can have some strong positions should disputes arise. That was just really quick covering some of the liability and issues. But what can you do? Use legal specific software on the right is just an example of Smokeball. We just uh, are almost out of beta testing with our AI. And so that's just an example. What can you do to avoid uh, liability or confidentiality issues? One of the biggest things is looking for legal specific companies who have guardrails in place to protect client confidentiality. That's going to be the biggest thing that you can do that will let you sleep that will let you sleep peacefully at night. And then also, like Florida said too, start including AI provisions into your fee agreements if you do plan on using them. Start addressing it with your office uh, as far as what they can and cannot do, what they can and cannot use. Because you'd be surprised at how many attorneys are utilizing chat GPT right now, and they probably have no idea about client confidentiality or that they're compromising it. All right, so talking really quick about the problem. <coughs> Sorry, I just can't stop coughing. All right, so, so I went way too overboard before, so we're going to kind of speed through this, So. The problem, advent and usage of LLMs. So LLM, again, get that out of your brain. It no longer means an advanced law degree. Uh, instead, you're going to replace that meaning, and it's going to be large language models. And that's, again, what GPT and other generative AI programs are based off of. That's where they're getting all of their information. That's how they're getting smarter and stronger and all that jazz. But this was kind of, this kind of just exploded. So the big, big surprise about a year, year and a half ago, was with LLMs with these large language models. You know, they've been talking about decades ago, hey, law is really great for AI. And you were, and we as attorneys were very much ignored by AI people and engineers who didn't want to hang out with lawyers very much. At least they didn't back then. Uh, but it turns out that this text and the structured text is really well situated for AI in general, the structured text that we use every day in law, right? Everything that we use from case law to statutes and all that jazz. And text is part of the way that we create understanding and intelligence. So large language models with generative AI are things that can synthesize these super large, large, large corpus of data. And summarizing text is what they are incredibly good at, which sounds a lot like what we do as attorneys every day, right? But as Joshua Walker uh, would also say, who's an expert in AI and the law, he was a co-founder of Stanford's Codex program. He said he would say, you know, we've got this really powerful engine right now and nobody updated the wheels. <laughs> you know, nobody updated the braking system, the transmission. We don't know where to go yet because the stuff is so powerful, but we can go much further. Like we don't have the maps that extend to the places where we want to go. So there's, you know, none of these roadmaps and signs, but we've got to create it. But where do we want to go? That's the biggest question. So I really have just two things for you to remember from this particular slide is, you know, one being be user centric, like be great, be a great, you know, software engineer of the law. Yes, we've become software engineers. Uh, but whether you're thinking about it from the perspective of a litigant or maybe you're in the courtroom and you're the judge or whether it's from your client's perspective, be mindful be client-centric when thinking about where you want to take AI into your practice. 
and ask, how is this going to help them? Especially with clients or especially just with people in general, how is this going to help them? And the answers can get very, very exciting for the market and size and for helping a lot of good. So for instance, you can help a lot of people in a lot of areas of law or from a lot of different economic backgrounds that you necessarily wouldn't have been able to help before. And the second thing that I would mention that's super important is the ABA's preamble. And nobody really talks about this <laughs> so much, but the ABA's preamble says that we, have an, we as attorneys have an implied duty to improve the administration of law. And we don't for the most part. I mean, we just haven't done that, right? I'm just trying to keep my head above water. I'm trying to make money and keep my firm afloat and pay off my school loans, which maybe will be paid off in 20 years. Who knows? Uh, but by leveraging ourselves, utilizing AI, we're actually getting opportunities to do this and to help more people. Talk about precedent. And I'm just going to speed through these because I'm so behind. All right. So the American Arbitration Association, not also called AAA, and I'll use AAA uh, throughout the next couple slides. That does not mean the American Automobile Association. This is the Ar American Arbitration Association, uh, but they, they are also the International Center for Dispute Resolution. So a bit of background as to why this matters, what they're doing. So the American Arbitration Association has really started embracing AI, and they're on a journey right now that's a little bit like, I don't know, the organ trail. Uh, and if you're, you know, which could be very dangerous, especially if you're trying to ford a river, but there's good things and bad things that can happen. You're going into kind of this new territory. It's very exciting, but we need some guideposts to help us. And Joshua Walker's suggestion was that we use the principles of competence, confidentiality, advocacy, impartiality, independence, and process improvement uh, in order to get there. So these things may sound familiar, right? Because they're based on the ethics uh, rules that we already have to adhere to. And there's many reasons to refer to legal ethical rules when we're talking about AI and how we use it and how we help our clients uh, because they don't necessarily know what they're doing either. But in reality, we have a duty to help our clients. And even in big cities where many of us work, right, we're hitting a good amount of the market for the rich or the people that can afford us, right? But for the poorest of the poor, for new immigrants that are getting taken advantage of or getting bad legal advice or people not familiar with, say, you know, the family court system, it's a disaster here. Uh, that's why so many people believe the entire idea of a fair justice system in America is kind of a farce, right? Not everybody is represented. If you have money, then that's basically the biggest barrier that you could possibly have or the biggest benefit to you uh, going into a court system. So it works great. <laughs> the system works great for like patent cases and for some really rich litigants. But in my experience, and I know the experience of a lot of attorneys who see people struggle, uh, access to justice is just getting worse as the wealth gap increases. And so if we can use AI to help more people with greater scale, we have a duty to do that per the ABA. But you'll see, and we're just gonna fly through these. So this is what the American Arbitration Association adopted. And I could go into detail, but we are running out of time. And so these are the six principles that I already talked about. <clears throat> and so what's interesting, though, is AAA released some strong wording with regard to its commitments on AI, you know, where they're going to prioritize the parties. They're going to implement updates with regard to the testing and production stages. Uh, they're going to apply diligence and testing before any release. They're going to adopt sound, flexible methodologies. They're going to use AI in a manner consistent with their mission, vision, and values. And this is a pretty bold statement, right, from an organization that's been around since 1926, right? So if they can do it, so can we. And I don't care whether you're a solo or, you know, you're a 2,000 person firm or you're a giant company or a mid-sized company. There is a way to do these things right. And there's a way to do it to where the community is helped tremendously by tech and by AI and by us at the end of the day as attorneys. You can get guides. You know, that's the big thing is there's a way to do it. You just can get help or you need, you just need to get help. You need to get guides. You know, if you're going on the Oregon Trail, get a guy. But also just don't abandon your principles. Okay, we already talked about that. Okay, this is getting into the bias sphere, as uh, Joshua Walker would call it. And I don't think I can go into detail on it. Please uh, read these slides. They're going to be very interesting as far as what he was saying. But essentially, it's uh, what we talked about before is everything is inherently biased, right? 
The problem is identifying that bias and working to make sure that you're not incorporating it into your AI and that you're not incorporating it into your answers. So if you know a specific AI is biased and you know its output, therefore, is going to be biased, there's a way that you can read that. There's a way that you can double check it to make sure that there is a human component into that that can hopefully eliminate or at least reduce the bias that's there. And a lot of this comes down to human interaction with AI, because at the end of the day, it's just like we were talking about for Florida rules, you are ultimately responsible for the output of your office. And so you should be reading every single document that is being filed in a case and you should be blessing it, right? If it's your name on it, you have blessed it and you are therefore responsible for it. And same thing happens if something is put out that has a specific bias, right? It's incumbent upon us to look at that, to read it from a hopefully objective perspective and then try to minimize that bias as much as possible. And maybe I can get more to this at the end after we answer questions. So we're about to head into Q&A. So if you have questions, I know this was a lot of information. Uh, if you have any questions, put that into the Q&A box. I will answer those in a minute. But I just wanted to say before we get to that, thank you again to Smokeball for hosting today's CLE. I know AI can be a little bit scary, and hopefully I didn't scare everybody too much, uh, but to me, legal technology is really critical to the success of law firms in my eyes. So if you're looking for something to really take your firm to the next level, maybe dip your toes into the waters of document automation and billing automation and AI, I highly encourage you to look into Smokeball. It absolutely changed the way that I practiced. And as I just said before, we also released our own generative AI features with proper guardrails in place. I'm telling you right now, uh, but we will be out of beta testing, I think, this month, which is really exciting. So I'm beyond thrilled about this and very pleased that we've been able to do this. All right, and then Austin's just going to be launching a poll real quick before we get to Q&A about if you'd like to learn more about Smokeball and how it can help your firm. If yes, we'll just reach out to you with more information. We'll probably schedule what they call a demo, which just takes you through half an hour, kind of what we do, what the software does, how it can help your particular firm, because a you know criminal law attorney is going to be vastly different and have vastly different needs from, say, me, a family law attorney, things like that. But it really, truly did change the way that I practiced when I adopted the software. And I advise law firms all the time about AI and about efficiency and about productivity. And when I tell you that you should be using some form of practice management software, if you would like to grow and you would like to grow without having a nervous breakdown, uh, I'm really not being hyperbolic about this. Smokeball is a great, great, great piece of software and it pays for itself, which is lovely and makes life easier, which is even better. Uh, so, and it really is just kind of an all-in-one system. So you never have to maintain 5 million different logins and 5 million different tabs on your screen in order to, you know, go about your daily work, which is how I used to function and it drove me nuts. And so it was one of those things, it's just cleaner, less stressful, it's all in one place and it's lovely. And the AI features that are coming out now are really fun. So one of them is called Matter AI, and it's basically you can chat with your case file. So if I'm trying to figure out what happened, you know, in February of last year with this case, or maybe if my client made it had a timeline pretty detailed, and I'm trying to figure out what happened in September of last year with her and the kids, I can ask that almost like chat GPT, right? I can ask that into the software and it will tell me, hey, based upon this document, this document, this document, here's what happened. So not only does it give you an answer, but it gives you the documents that it pulls those answers from so that you can double check your work and stay compliant with your state bar. So pretty, pretty cool, amazing piece of software. And so it's just gonna be exponential growth probably from here for generative AI stuff, but it's been a lot of fun to see it being used in our own program. All right, Austin, we'll get off of that. And also, again, just want to mention that we are a member benefit provider for the Florida Bar, which means you get a 10% discount on our products. So if you have any questions about that whatsoever, scan that QR code. Austin will put the link into that chat. You can click on that. But this is a very, very cool offer, and I highly encourage you to take advantage of it. And here, as promised, is your CLE information. So today was good for an hour of general credit and an hour of ethics credit, everybody's favorite thing. Uh, the course number for today's webinar is 8437. Again, that's 8437. All right, and do we have any questions? Yes, Jordan, we have a number of really good questions here. Let's start off with this one. 
What should I look for when vetting software with AI? Yeah, I think the bars are probably going to promulgate some more stuff on this. But when you're looking at, hey, I want to start adopting AI or, hey, my friend uses this program. I think it would be really cool to use in my law office. Absolutely explore it. Take a demo of it. You should be taking a demo of every piece of software that you have just to see if it works with your firm. But the number one thing that you're really going to need to ask about is confidentiality. So where does that data go? The data that's input into this AI program, where does it go? Who is it shared with? Does it stay just with me? Does it stay just on my servers or does it get transferred to a third party? And so again, if you're using something like the publicly available chat GPT, that is not stored, you know, that is not stored or it has no guardrails in place to just, you know, never leave your firm, that's going to be shared with the general public and it's going to be used to train future language models. So that to me is the biggest thing to ask about when you're looking at AI software is to ask about the guardrails that they have in place. But here's the deal too, and until we get more transparency on this, it's hard because everybody's basing a lot of these off of GPT, which is great, but OpenAI, it's still kind of like a proprietary black box. Nobody really knows necessarily how it works fully. Uh, and, you know, they kind of keep that close to the vest. So we're going to end up finding out more information on that too. But I would say if you're looking at software, look for legal specific software. Because other pieces of software could have great and powerful AI features, but they don't give a shit about your bar license. So they don't necessarily care about confidentiality. They can say, oh yeah, it's secure, but you need to be asking, what is it shared with? What is it, where does this information go? If I input this into the system, where does it live, right? Whose server does it live on? And who has access to that server, right? Is this being, is this being used <clears throat> to train any other type of software? So those are what you need to ask. If you're using legal specific software, so say you're looking at Smokeball or say you're looking at something like Case Text, right? Which is now bought by Thomson Reuters, say you're looking at that, there are guardrails in place to ensure that your data is not shared, period. And so that's what, and that's why it's so important to look for legal specific software if you're wanting to use generative AI, because these companies understand your bar license, they want to keep your, you know, they want to keep your business and they do not want to compromise your data. So they have a vested interest in privacy with regard to your firm and your clients. All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question here, Jordan. What's a good starting point into experimenting with AI? If you haven't downloaded chat, or not downloaded, you don't need to download it, but if you haven't experimented with chat GPT, that's kind of like a nice little gateway drug uh, into generative AI, and it's free. So just go to chat, I think it's chat.openai.com, and go there, make an account, it's free, and just start asking questions. You know, and they can be, you know, they can be legal specific, but don't take that as truth at all, right? You can kind of see what they say. So, for instance, maybe you're hitting, uh, <laughs> you just have brain fog, you're hitting a dead end, and you're trying to prep for trial the next day. And oh, I need to write my opening statement, but I'm so brain dead. Well, you can go into Chat GPT and say, hey, I have a divorce with children. Here are the overarching themes or issues, right, without revealing anything confidential and say, please draft me an opening statement. And it'll do it. And it's actually pretty good. And you can take that from there and then tweak it, do what you need to do, put in your own case details, things like that. But it's a great little starting point just for ideating at the end of the day. So that's what I would do is I would just go to chat.openai.com or just Google chat GPT and it'll bring you there too. But make an account, start playing around with it. And what's cool is you can change everything. So for instance, if you're trying to write an email to a client and you're just brain dead, you can, at, you can say, okay, here's the email I want to write to the client, ask GPT to do it without putting in confidential information, obviously. <laughs> and then you can say, hey, I'm friendly with this client. Can you change the tone of this email? And it will change the tone of the email. Or maybe you're trying to write something to opposing counsel and you say, I would like to sound, I would like this letter to sound formal. Or hey, I don't really like this opposing counsel. I want this letter to sound XYZ. And it will change that tone and do it for you. So it's very interesting, very fun to play around with. But that would be the first thing that I would do if I was experimenting with AI because it's free. And as long as you're not putting confidential information into it, it's a lot of fun to play around with. All right, and I think we're just out of time. So thank you all for joining me 
If you want to find me, I'm jordan.turk at smokeball.com. Feel free to send me an email, any questions you might have. I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me there, message me there. I love to talk about AI. I love to talk about legal technology. So just let me know if you ever have any questions, but thank you so much for stopping by.